Amen. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for what you're doing with us as a church. Thank you for the amazing way that you have actually grown us and multiplied us in this area of London. And Lord, thank you for what you're doing in our lives individually. Thank you, Lord, that your desire is for us to grow, to grow not just physically uh, growing up, but to grow up into you as well, to grow in our understanding and, uh, and uh, the impact of you in our lives. And we pray that that would overflow even today, Lord, that you would grow us into you more and more. Pray that you would help us as well to catch what you're doing here. We long, Lord, for, um, for to see you break out in different ways that uh, impact us, impact our community, impact our city. And we pray even today, even this morning, that you would help us to, to do that, to catch that. In Jesus' name and for your sake. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning. It's great to see you. Uh, if you're new here, my name is Rick. I'm the rector of the church, Louis. Um, we're married. Lou is leading the service today. And it's really, really great to be back. If you, um, hadn't, if you haven't seen me for a few months, it's because we've been away on sabbatical and we are back um, raring to go uh, and um, get uh, stuck into what God has for us here. And um, you might be thinking, what on earth is Rick reading um, Genesis 26 here for? Um, this passage, which is about digging wells and filling them in and then redigging them and um, all of that. And so I want, what I want to do is to explore this passage because I think God is saying something to us about redigging wells. It's part of the calling of our church and just looking at it through this picture of, um, of a well filled up and then redigging it to find um, water that brings life. So that's, that's where we're heading with this. And I don't know if you've ever... Um, We've all had beach holidays, haven't we? Maybe you haven't. But if you, you know, beach holidays, I don't know if you've ever tried digging, um, digging a, uh, down into the sand to try and get water at the bottom. Have you ever done that and you kind of dig, dig it down? You get to the, basically the tide level um, where, the, where the water is. And no matter how hard you try, it's just quite difficult to get a proper amount of water in there because the sides keep on filling with sand and you just never get very deep and unless you've got some dredger or something, which is kind of massive um, digging machine, which you might take to the um, beach. There's one friend of ours who we're used to using these plastic spades and stuff and he comes with this garden spade and just in about three minutes does what takes us three hours to dig a, a, a kind of hole in the sand. Is challenging. But you know, in the time of Isaac, this was a standard practice to dig holes in order to find water so that you can survive. Here in, um, how many people have switched on a tap today? Everyone. We've all used a tap today. We're just so used to running water, aren't we? You know, running water, relatively speaking, is quite a new thing. So here in Shadwell, um, running water came mid-19th century, early 19th century. Um, although down in Lower Shadwell, what is now Wapping, Lower Shadwell, this used to be a, a slope going into the River Thames. There was a guy called um, Thomas Neal who um, bought loads of land around here. And he had a waterworks down in Lower Shadwell that, um, in the um, 17th century. And that supplied water for this whole area. And people would... Um, go from their, uh, their dwellings, they would take a bucket with them, they'd go to the waterworks where the water had been siphoned off and cleaned and they brought their bucket back and used that for cooking, washing, cleaning, everything. And um, after the fire of London, that was the only waterworks that actually survived London. So a very important area in terms of, uh, of providing water. Later on, um, it all became uh, mechanized and the waterworks companies started to see opportunity of making money from supplying water to the businesses and so on. And so the waterworks grew. And actually, in, on this site, um, just by the south wall, uh, there was a spring in Shadwell. And this became uh, an important part of people just collecting water in this particular area. 
And with the kind of, um, there's kind of different views on the etymology, the origins of, of the word Shadwell, but St. Chad's Well might have been named after this well. St. Chad's Well, Shadwell. You see, that's the, that's the probably likelihood of where the word Shadwell came from. And it's no surprise that a church is planted on the spot of a well. The significance between the providing of natural water and the need for spiritual water, the water of life. So God's intention for this place, right from the beginning, this place, this church, was that it should be a provider of spiritual life. The water of life that comes from Jesus. And that water is not to be kept for ourselves, it's to give away, to freely give. Back to this passage. Isaac is the son of Abraham. And right at the beginning, we can see the promise that God made to Abraham. Look in verse 4. Isaac's dad, Abraham, God spoke to him and said this, I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and will give them all these lands and through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed. That was the promise. Abraham was an old man, didn't have any children. He says, you're going to have children. Isaac was the miraculous product of that first bit of the promise. Second promise is about the land. It would take them quite a few generations before they actually um, properly um, took over the land. But he says, almost like, a, you know, get ready for this. I want you to stay here. Don't go off to Egypt where there's supplies and water and all that kind of thing. Stay here. Stay in this land. And the third promise is that I'm going to be a blessing to all nations through your offspring. And that promise was fulfilled through Jesus. Jesus is the blessing to all nations. Jesus, the Israelite, the man from Israel, who is going to be a blessing to the whole world. Israel lost sight of that, to be a blessing to the whole world. And so they, they kind of narrowed it down and narrowed it down to, to being just the people who are on their own. But actually God's intention was always that the people of God should be a blessing to the whole world. And so this promise from God, is a, you know, he reminds Isaac, you're part of this promise. That he says to us, you're part of this promise to be a blessing to all nations. This promise is a threat because they'd run out of water. They needed water to survive. They're a nomadic group of people. They go from place to place, live in tents. And the promise is at stake of being cut off right at the beginning because they don't have any water. And God says, I want you to stay. Stay in this place. Stay in Gerar. And the thing is that God called him to do that, to explore, to, to find these physical wells and dig them out as a picture of the spiritual life that he wants to give to Isaac and um, through, all, you know, through his um, whole family, his livestock, his, um, the people who worked for him, everything to be a blessing through him, to provide for that water. And God wants, in the same way, he wants to provide that flow of water, that flow of spiritual water, that, that, that water of life to flow in your life. He wants um, that water to flow in the life of this church. He wants that life to flow out of this church into this whole community, to join with other churches where it's the same thing. And just as there was a threat to the flow of water to Isaac's community, there's always a threat to the flow of the water of life in our community. There's always a threat to that. Jesus said, let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. And the challenge is, just as those wells were blocked up, we get blocked up as well. We get blocked up in the, from the life of God flowing through our lives. Is that right? Certainly it's true in my life. It's not all that it should be. Why is that? Well, just looking at this passage, there's some helpful insights. First one is neglect. Isaac had moved on. His eyes actually were set on somewhere else. Grass is greener in Egypt. I'm going to go there. He neglected some of these wells. We can neglect our own spiritual lives. We can neglect to pray. That connection, that vital connection with God. 
that daily connection that God wants us to have is easy to neglect. This is a call to unblock our spiritual lives by prayer, regular prayer. It's also about coming to church. You know, you're here, but actually it's, um, it's so easy when we stop going to church. We lose that life of the, of the community encouraging us to follow Jesus. Neglect. The second thing we see here is spiritual attack. So look at um, verse 14. Isaac had so many flocks and herds and servants that the Philistines envied him. So the wells that his father's servants had dug in the time of his father Abraham, the Philistines stopped up, filling them with earth. So the Philistines are jealous. They're jealous of Isaac and God's blessings in his life. And they deliberately, intentionally try to cut off that life by filling in these wells, stopping water being available to um, his family. That meant death or moving on. And if we're not on our guard, we will get into trouble ourselves. We have an enemy, um, James tells us, who is prowling around like a roaring lion. Satan is out to get anyone who's seeking after God. And we will experience trouble. We will experience attack from time to time. We need to be aware of that because that's going to stop the flow if we give in to that of God's blessing in your life. There's opposition. So he's, started, he's found this valley, Gerar Valley, and starts digging wells. And um, there are these three wells that we hear are digging about, um, uh, uh, that are dug. Esek, in verse 20, you need to kind of, this is a lesson in Hebrew, I guess. Esek, which means, um, you look at the bottom of the page, means dispute. He names this well dispute because the local people said, it's not your well, it's our well. Again, the next place he moves on to, he has to name Sitna because there are quarrels about that one as well. And finally, he finds this well called, that he calls Rehoboth. It's a place meaning room or space. He's found a place where he can experience the space to encounter God, to encounter his life, his blessing. God, sometimes when we're seeking him, we will find that we experience opposition from people or circumstances. And we need discernment, don't we, to, to know whether to stay and work through that opposition or to move to the place where there's space, where God is saying, actually, this is the place you need to be um, uh, getting involved. This is the place where you need to be investing your heart and your life. I think the fourth thing is sin, actually deliberate sin. The part which we didn't read um, between verses um, 7 and 11 is about where actually um, Isaac effectively lies about his wife. And he says, actually, she's my sister. So that, you know, because he fears for his own life. He thinks that people are going to kill him because he's got a beautiful wife and they'll have the wife instead. And so he lies. He doesn't trust God. He lies. It's an intentional sin. Intentional sin blocks up the flow of God's um, spirit in our lives. So all these different ways that um, are, are like a well being stopped up, like a well being filled up in our own lives. God's intention is for that well to be un, you know, dug, redug, so that it produces the water, the life of the Spirit that He longs to see flowing in our lives. The gospel, the good news, is that Jesus has come to deal with all the blockages in our lives. He comes to deal with it head on. Where we're like in the sand trying to uncover the water and that sand just keeps on filling up that space. Jesus came to deal with that completely, to dig a well in our lives, a well of salvation that enables us to be free from our sins, enables us to be free from um, the uh, impact of uh, spiritual attack, to be set free from the ultimate um, hindrance of death. Jesus says, if you put your trust in me, if you come to me, I will give you water that leads to eternal life. He says, come and drink from this. 
And this passage, I think, is a picture for us. It's a picture for us individually. We need those wells that God has for us to be unblocked so that we can drink from the water of life, drink from the water that he gives so that our lives can flow with what God wants um, to pour through us and um, out to others. But also it's, it's a picture for us as a church that God, you know, the, the St. Paul's Shadwell, the place where there's a well of, of life that might have been blocked up in previous generations is now, you know, for our generation, we need to see it unblocked so that the life of God can flow within this church and from this church to this community. And I say it's not just for St. Paul's, it's for every church, but we have the responsibility here for our church. And just our own story um, is uh, that in 2004, this church had just 10 people left in it. For various reasons, um, people moving away, different demographic um, uh, context that the church was ministering, and just 10 people left in the church, um, 10 regulars. And um, they were going to close the church because there are three other churches very close by, three other Anglican churches. And the Bishop of London said, actually, why don't we do something new here? And he invited Sandy Miller, who is the vicar at Holy Trinity Brompton, a church in West London, to say, would you like to send a group of people to come and restart this church, redig this well? And uh, Louis and I and um, a team of 100 people all together, our children were number 98, 99, and 100 um, on our team, uh, came from that church to replant this one. We joined the 10 faithful praying people and added that 100. 80 of them already lived in East London. They were commuting across to go to church in West London. They said, no, actually, let's um, join the team to be part of this. And 20 others moved from West London, different parts of London. Um, some sold houses to come to be with us here. And God has grown this church. God has called other people to come and join us here. And some have come to Christ through the work of this church. And it's grown and grown, which is amazing. We've seen... Uh, the church impacting our local community in different ways. And it's been fantastic to see just um, different things happening. So just, uh, I want to affirm um, Gareth uh, Haddo at the back there, um, back corner, um, hiding away. Gareth just come back from Philadelphia where he was um, uh, brought there for the work of um, ambassadors in sport um, and the football ministry that he um, leads um, here in East London, um, helping Muslim dads and their sons to spend time together um, around football, something that's been growing. Um, you know, Chris here at the front is involved in that. He, um, as a doctor, helps kind of uh, help people with medical conditions, and he prays for them uh, with medical conditions as well. It's part of what God is doing with that. And um, Gareth was. Uh, in a competition, they were down to the last three out of um, f over 400 um, people uh, to do with charities that were impacting their community, and um, they came second. They didn't get the top prize, they came second, which is amazing. And also, he's won a, um, an award from Tower Hamlets with a gift to that ministry as well, because they recognize the work that Gareth is doing. That's the water of life flowing through Gareth and Chris and others to impact that local community with the love of Christ. That's amazing, isn't it? Let's give Gareth just a big hand. It's Amazing work, amazing work. That is just one example of the way the water of life is flowing through this church to impact the local community. Um, we've had the privilege of um, reopening, if you like, wells in other places. So we sent a team to Bethnal Green, St. Peter's with Adam and Heather Atkinson, uh, to join the church there. But actually, they've seen amazing growth in that church. They had 20 in the church. We sent a team of about 20. They're now 120. In Bow, there were just seven in the congregation. They were just not sure what to do about the church, probably going to close it. And we sent a small team, about 10 people, to join the seven there. And that church has grown to 110, 120 people as well, just in the last three years. Just in January, we 
I'm kind of pointing in different directions over there, <laughs> is Millwall. And Ed and Fuzz Dix took a team of 15 adults and about 15 children to um, go and join the, uh, the kind of 10, 15 people who were in a church which, is, which has been knocked down or being knocked down. And they're going to rebuild it and restart it. And that local parish said, come and help us to um, reestablish this church. And they're already growing. There are over 50 people in that church. So um, what God has called us to do is, is, is to be part of this redigging wells in the churches that have been established in this area already. That's part of the calling. That's part why our passion is to see churches planted. We can play our part, not just in growing this church, but actually taking, being prepared to say, actually, I'd love to go and be part of a team going to another church to bring that back to life. So this is our vision. Our vision is to see Shadwell and East London transformed by Jesus. The way we feel God's called us to do it is by making disciples. That's us. Growing in our discipleship, helping one another to dig these wells so that we can access all that God has for us. To be part of transforming our communities around us. Whether it's loving our neighbor, very simply, or um, or some of these ministries, death advice, um, football, getting dads and, and their sons together, um, the night shelter that runs here, street pastors that is, um, is part of what a, a number of people are involved here in. Just different ways we want to see our community transformed by the love of Jesus and, of course, planting churches. So how can we do this? Well, five quick Ps, five Ps. There are lots and lots of P's that I could do. I've narrowed it down to five. The first one is prayer. P for prayer. We need to unblock passion in our lives. We need to unblock passion. And that's what God wants to do with us. He wants to unblock a passion for him. His uh, encouragement, Jesus' encouragement to us is to seek first the kingdom and his righteousness. And all the other things in life will be added to you once you get that right. We need to stoke up, stir up passion for God in our lives. And where it's blocked, we need to say, Lord, please unblock that passion. Please unblock that passion. Help me to pray. Help me to stir up the life of God in my own life. Help us as a church to stir up prayer um, so that it, we can ca- kind of catch the passion of what God is doing. I think it's very exciting. We're in a new season at St. Paul's, particularly in this 11 o'clock service. Um, we've had a fantastic investment from Andrew and Megan Sercombe, who have gone back to Australia now in, in the whole area of worship and, and ministry. And it's just fantastic to have Matt and Laura uh, Tinsley here to help take, you know, take that mantle, really, and to develop it and grow it. And God wants us in our worship together corporately, in the life we have together corporately, to seek God, to unblock passion. And, you know, Louis and I, we want to lead this from the front. We want to say, Lord, we, our passion is blocked and we, we don't want it to be that way. We want to give ourselves to worship and prayer. This is a season for all of us. And that starts daily on our own. Daily prayer. We need to get into daily prayer. We need to help each other with this. It's the most, you know, less than 10% of the church um, around the West prays um, daily. And we want to make that 90%, so 10% are struggling with it. And so we need to encourage each other, to help each other, to pray. And uh, I would love to encourage you to pray for this church as part of your daily prayers. We're going to be moving the Tuesday prayer meeting, Tuesday morning to Thursday morning, so it doesn't clash with um, connect groups, so it's quite a long day on Tuesdays, so that Thursday is going to become a new prayer morning, a prayer breakfast, and the, uh, every two months, our Kingdom Come prayer meeting is um, early evening. Come to that. There's something, God is doing something with those as well. We want to seek God and encounter Him, um, uh, unblock that passion in our lives through praying. Um, the exciting thing, I'm, uh, I'm part of the, uh, a team in the Diocese of London to do with the Diocesan Vision. And one of the things that they're trying to really stir up in, in, in the next seven years of Vision, CV 2020, it's called Capital Vision 2020 by that year, is that all of us might be praying for seven people. Seven people, seven years. If we all pray for seven people and just one of them um, starts joining the church, then our church has doubled. So if everyone out of those seven has one, 
who comes to church. Our church doubles. We need to pray. We need to be stirring up prayer. We need to unblock passion for God in our lives. Second P is provision. Provision. We need to unblock generosity. Um, we, uh, generosity is always challenged. And we love being generous with um, our, our, the provisions that God has given us. It's like, okay, we're just going to decide to be generous, even though we don't feel like being generous. And um, that's sometimes what, what we're called for, because it enables others to be provided for. God wants to be a blessing to us and through us to the whole world. He wants to bless all the nations through the offspring of Abraham's family. That's us, to be a blessing to all the nations. And that is part of generosity. So we need to pray, God, unblock generosity in my life, in the life of this church, in the life of this city. And um, uh, one of our values as a church is give it away. Give it away. We want to have that front and center, these, va- these, these values, just saying, Lord, this is what we're aspiring to. This is what we want to press into. And we need to grow in that generosity. And we need to ask of ourselves that question, Lord, how can I be generous? It's so easy. I find it so easy to look at other people and think, wow, it's so good that God's raised those people up. And, but actually, we need to be generous. Um, just this morning, uh, Helen Stengel was praying in the 9.30 service. And one of the things she said from something she'd read, she said that 9% of um, people in this nation are involved in charities. I thought, wow, only 9%. And perhaps the church, between 5 and 10%, should be the vast majority of those people at the very least. We need to be those who say, I'm going to be generous with my time. I'm going to be generous with the gifts, the talents that God has given me. And I'm going to be generous with the treasures that God has given me. The money, the possessions. I want to give these things away. Actually, I I don't want to give them away, but I know that when I give them away, actually there's such joy in that that I want to get into that place where I can be generous. And if you're anything like me, I need God to soften my heart in the whole area of generosity. Lord, soften my heart. Where I'm hard-hearted about giving stuff up that is precious to me, my time, my talents, my treasure, Lord, soften my heart that I can just freely give these things away because there's such blessing. Um, I think as a church, um, we need to move away from putting loose change in the offering to something which is thought through and um, proportional to the income that we receive. We need to think that through each one of us. What is going to help us to be generous with what we've been given? And it's a, you know, so that's, I think, just part of being generous as a people. Take a step back from that and just think, actually, the church will benefit from your generosity as it does already. We've had extraordinary generosity over the years. And um, I, our aim, our call to every one of us is to try to give proportionately to the life of the church. If you don't already, we want to encourage you to give by um, direct debit, and um, there are these forms at the back of church. Um, you can start a simple direct debit. Just even a, f- you know, a few pounds each month is the start if you don't do that at the moment. But different people give different amounts, 50, 100 pounds a month. Some people give 500 pounds a month, um, depending on your income. It's, you know, it's what your, um, you, you and God want to do together. You work it out for yourselves. Um, but the challenge is, I guess... Are you giving to the church? And do you need to unblock generosity um, in order for the church to be provided for? And actually, there are other things that God might want to um, enable provision through you for as well. So just something to pray through yourself. Third P, so prayer, provision, pipeline. What do I mean by pipeline? Well, there's obviously all the connotations with water flowing through it, but a pipeline of leaders and people in this church who are playing their part. This is about unblocking growth in the life of this church. And growth comes when people step forward and say, I'm standing up to be counted. I want to be a part of this. And leaders um, will be followed by people. So when someone takes a lead in a ministry, other people gather around them and start helping, and that ministry thrives. So an example of that is um, Sarah Opie, who is a member of the church. She um, said, I want to help with night shelter. 
Night Shelter's just get, getting going in, um, in Tower Hamlets. said, I'd love to um, be a, uh, someone who can enable this to happen, member of this church. And she now has 70 people in the church who are volunteering for that ministry to help Night Shelter. It starts at the beginning of November. Fantastic. That's leadership. That's someone who God has raised up to say, I'm, I'm going to make a difference. And they're leading, and that ministry has grown as a result of her stepping up. Different people can step up in different ways. I think we all need to step forward and say, Lord, count me in. I want, how can I help? I love um, our son Barney has just uh, gone to a new school and they have CCF, Combined Cadet Force, and he is really keen on this. So he's just joined the cadets. He gets his uniform next week, so he's really, really excited. One of the things they have as their objective is they say, we're not going to teach you soldiering. I mean, they're only children. We're not going to teach you soldiering. We're going to teach you leadership. And then they say, the way we're going to teach you leadership is by you serving they overtly say this, and they say, you will learn to lead by learning to be led. When you, basically unpacking that, it's when we submit ourselves to those in authority, we will learn about leadership. And God will, in his time, raise up, uh, us up to be a leader ourselves. Because we've learned to be led, and we can learn to lead others by learning to be led ourselves. God is calling people in this church not just to be leaders, but to be servants, to be people who say, Lord, how can I help? I want to be part of this pipeline to provide um, help in these ministries, help provide leadership, help um, uh, enable things to happen. And uh, it's very exciting when we see that happening. And it's you know, like uh, the football ministry, like the death advice, like you know, so many different ways. And just what, you know, for yourselves, work out, how, Lord, how can I serve? What, what is the, you, know, you might have five minutes a month, and I say to you as a leader, I say, okay, let's use that five minutes to be a blessing to the church. Fourth P is planting, planting churches. This is something which is um, growing in the life of the church in London, around the country, around the world. Lots and lots of churches are planting churches, but we don't often talk about it in the Anglican church because we have parish churches which have been here for a long time. But there is a need, like this one, to replant into churches which are growing smaller and smaller. They've lost their way in some way. And God has called us to be a church-planting church. We live in one of um, the three most poor boroughs in the country. It's Hackney, Tower Hamlets, and Newham, the three poorest um, boroughs. We're number three in the country. And there is a great need for us to plant churches to, to see the poor reached for Christ. They're neglected in lots of different ways. And the church in this country is mainly middle class. We need to reach the poor. And we can only do that as a church, really, by, well, the most effective way is by planting churches. And there is, um, you know, Bill Hybels coined this, the local church is the hope of the world. That's true. When people find Christ in a local church, their lives are turned around and they become completely different people. They begin to look outwards, begin to love their neighbors, and whole neighborhoods change because Christians are loving their neighbors. It's not just planting Sunday services, but planting ministries. It's planting death advice, planting um, you know, football ministries, planting night shelters and so on. It all has an impact. We've already planted three churches. We need to be planting a lot more. We need to accelerate our church planting. I don't know how we do that, um, but we need to grow in it. We need to learn how to do that. But we need to be prepared to do that as well. And that, that will cost money. We're still supporting less and less each year, but still supporting um, All Hallows Bow. And that's another reason we need to raise money here is so that we can keep supporting the ministry in one of the most difficult areas in Tower Hamlets. This year, we're going to give them about £35,000 just to help the ministry of that church to keep going. It's an important part. That's why we need to give here so that we can enable um, churches in other places as well. Play your part in redigging these wells. Final P. So we've had power. No, sorry, we've had, that's the fifth P. We've given it away. We had prayer. <laughs> we've had provision. We've had pipeline. We've had planting. And fifthly, power power. We need to unblock spiritual power from our lives by saying, Jesus, we need your power. We need to unblock the power of God unblocked in our lives. Jesus said, 
how much more will my Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? So if we ask him for more of the Holy Spirit, he will give us more of the Holy Spirit. Then he said to the disciples, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So we ask for more of the Spirit and the Spirit gives power to be witnesses, power to be a blessing to the nations, power to be a blessing to your neighbor. And we are looking for men and women who are prepared to stand up and say, Lord, count me in. Lord, I need your power. I'm weak without you. I can't do anything without you. But I'm prepared to be counted. I want to play my part in your purposes at St. Paul's and Shadwell and East London, in this city, in this nation. We've got people, guests from uh, abroad, in the nations. God has called us to see the wells that will give us life unblocked. And what are the blockages for you that are stopping us from experiencing the water of life that are going to give us life that's going to be not just a blessing for us, that's not going to just provide life for us, but provide life for those all around us. Please stand.